Welcome to This Epic Life, the podcast. I'm your host, Bailey Bennett Andrade, and today we're here with two very special people. So first we have Epic Education Equity Trainer, Rosina Capadia, and she's going to be walking us through the RIR protocol and compassionate dialogue in this episode. And then for our guest, we have Stephen Armstrong who has made impacts around the world by helping women who suffer from childbirth injuries. He recently published a novel called Dragon Daughter, which is about a young black female superhero. Super powerful stuff. So to begin, Stephen, we would love to walk through what did you recognize in your work helping women that made you ultimately create a book that was about a young female navigating life? Oh, well, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I think what I saw most was the, well, the, the initial uh, piece that hit me more was the um, inequity of the women who were suffering from the condition. Already off, off the top, they're, they're not able to access ad, um, adequate health care. They're, they're poor. They don't have a lot of uh, resources to get to hospitals and some, some some cases where they live it's just not um feasible like they live too far away you know there's uh terrain that's hard to hard to get to through to places on foot sometimes they're in um marriages that don't allow for certain for, they don't allow for them to go to the hospital without um you know a, a male's approval so a lot of those things I factored into uh the book in the in in the way that we're just there uh, in a way that that helped me understand more I, and i didn't realize this as i was writing the book but when um, when I'd finished certain pieces, I would go, oh, this is clearly something that comes from the work and recognizing the inequities that women have just in general, just for, from educational uh, stuff or job prospects and, and, and the most sort of natural thing, which should be a beautiful experience for them to have a child. Even there, there's no, um, there's no real um, equity there for them to, they could be, they could be dying and still not be, you know, be allowed uh, space to go get, you know, get a proper prenatal care and like a lot of the basic stuff that you, you need to make sure you have. Having a kid is not um, a small thing. It's a it's a pretty big thing. <laughs> Even here in the U.S. with like all the resources and stuff we have, it's not a, it's not a joke. <laughs> so you can imagine somewhere, you know, if you're somewhere else in the, in the developing world where you don't have um, adequate resources or you don't have um, proper uh, tools or care or, or medical staff around to help you do that. Definitely. So tell us a little bit more about where you're, where you're talking about these developing countries. Where so, do you go? Or primarily um, so, um, uh, Africa and Southeast Asia. So uh, we had the, there were I want to say 25, 30 countries that we worked in across you know Sub-Saharan Africa and then um, and then Southeast Asia. I think primarily where I, I went, we got to go to I went to Kenya to visit uh, uh, different parts in Kenya from. Uh, um, Nairobi and the Mumia, some of the more rural areas to see, visit the hospitals and meet some of the women and um, just to see the sort of the impact of the work. I think there was the trip was supposed to be uh, geared around having staff people just understand the depth of, of the work that we were doing and meeting personally some of the, the women and having them touch you and say, hey, what you did is, is important. Because here in California, I'm thinking like I'm one person at a desk answering phones, you know, doing some stuff around in my comfortable computer, whatever, I'm not doing anything that's, you know, that's me, that me, even though I was passionate about the work, I didn't feel like, sometimes it, didn't, it was hard to feel like you were doing any real good. Right. And so hearing it from, and it's one thing to hear from donors, but to hear from the people directly who you're assisting, not just the women, but the, the hospital staff and how gracious and how humble they were and how they attacked uh, the condition of obstetric fistula, like, um, like it was like a war. They treated it like a, this is like they have guys who are like generals. And these group, you guys are guys who are doing your captains. You guys go out and go to the, go into the communities and talk to the women here. They had a very strategic process of how they're approaching the work and what we were doing overseas and how that was helping them. Like we were, you know, giving, you know, providing the resources, helping them, you know, with like the funds. But they were spearheading it. They were actually running it. They realized the the the, the organization realizes quickly that in order for there to be any real effect, like it has to take place on the ground there. People, you know, we can't just be coming in and be like, hey, we have what you need, you know, this right. is this and telling you what you need and telling you how to how to help. They know more intimately what the issues are there and how to get around them. If it's cultural, sometimes you have to deal with like village elders or right. different there's a whole bunch of different stuff. And then there's like civil war. There's there's tons of stuff happening that that they know how to navigate more effectively mm-hmm. than someone coming in from the outside. So I think understanding that more deeply 
and going to, to, to see some of that stuff firsthand um, was really powerful and very um, emotional. I, hadn't, I mean, I expected, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not ashamed to admit this, Virginia knows this about me. I, you know, I'm pretty emotional. I, I cry about a lot of stuff. So it was even here reading, I never went through a, a, a process there during the job, even when I was writing the stories where I was not emotional, hearing stories from the women over the phone or trying to find the best way to accurately represent the stories that they, like what their life experience is. How do I honor their experience? And mm -hmm. then at the same time, there's something very sacred about all of that being, I was the lone, the lone male at that group. I was, you know, uh, working there around all these women, powerful women and helping other women and hearing stories from other women here in the States who felt somehow, they just felt compelled to share with me these very personal, very intimate stories about their childbirth. So meeting women and having them talk about their experience and share everything they went through. A lot of these women were going through some traumatic experiences. Those, those are some of the things that I saw. And I think I, I don't, I don't think I came back the same. Like I'm still sort of mm -hmm. working through my experience of that. And, um, uh, and just the, how powerful it was. It really was uh, life-changing. And that was my first trip over, I'd never left the country before. So my first trip going overseas and actually really getting to uh, experience sort of the, the reality of, of, of what that is actually going like on the ground not just in the cities and the nice places but really going to the villages so yeah. where there's no electricity there's no no clean water like the real stuff and it was really it was really powerful it's, it still affects me today so you recognize abroad that in these less developed nations there were these issues of inequity and lack of access and then you also shared with us that when you came back to the states that you actually noticed that there was another access issue here on our shores yeah. so could you tell us a little bit about what you recognize there as well yes thank you baby that's a great segue into to that i um one of my my jobs one of my duties was you know i was first responder on the, on the telephone so we get you know get a lot of calls people who are you know donating or people who had questions about what we were doing or whatever so but one of the other calls that they weren't super frequent but they were frequent enough to where i was affected by what i was hearing so we would get calls from people here in the states who um were suffering from um uh their own version of either uh, a fistula uh, causes related to either childbirth or surgical mishap or what, what have you and they called they either would call to see if we had uh, any way to provide resources, um, surgical care, whatever, whatever, whatever was related to that, they could possibly get them care. And um, we didn't, we didn't really have anything uh, in place, like, uh, because primarily our goal was where, where the, the mission was helping women abroad who didn't have, who had le way less access. Um, uh, fund, just uh, initially, we didn't have anything set up for that. So I I was concerned about, I kept, I, get, I got enough calls to where I was concerned about that, brought it up to my supervisor at the time. And I was, I was bothered by the fact that we, we, we're a fiscal organization uh, in the States that has, you know, we have some resources, we have some resources that we're, we're helping some people with, but then there are people here, right here in our own backyard that don't have the same care. The issue, part of the issue was that, you know, fiscal is not super prevalent here in the United States. It's, um, it, but it, do, it does happen. It's prevalent enough to where it's like, okay, well, you know, there's, there are a lot, there are not a lot of places that, that know how to properly um, conduct the surgery. And it's like, well, how do you, and then it was hard to find which hospitals here in the U.S. that, could, that would do the surgery, depending on the location of where the women, the women were. And my supervisor asked, she said, well, you know, you're, you're right. There, we had an old list. There was an old list that was put together, sort of like a um, directory of like places that um, we could give to people to have them call to see what the next steps would be. And it was assigned to, uh, to me to uh, then try to, to, to update the list and add, sort of see what I could do and add, add more to that list. But the, the limits of my job duties were that it was just like, this is the list, make the list. And then just if someone calls, just email them the list. Uh, at first it was like, okay, that's a step in the right direction because at least we're moving the ball to sort of get things um, updated and more something more robust that, that people can actually take action with. What I found out what, um, after that was more like, well, okay, this is, I know that I'm not supposed to be doing more than what my job duties are this, but it was hard to not, to hear those stories and not like do more or like stay that extra hour on the phone with that one person who needed like um, help with like searching for something or just as we called, we called places together. Those things I wasn't necessarily supposed to be doing, but it was, it was, it was important to me to, to help 
them understand that, that, that they're just not just another woman who's coming into a facility who's acting up, they're just a crazy woman. That all they needed was someone to, to, to get to examine them. They needed someone to see them. And it's hard to, it was just hard to do that without having to, um, at least for them, with already with not, not a lot of access. And so the list, the, creating a new list was a huge step in the right direction to help make sure that there were updated um, resources for people to uh, to call. It was and it was it was tough. I said I don't know that I fully succeeded in that, but it was it was a it was a it was a task that I thought was important enough to take on, to just to to make sure that well we're still going to get calls and it, I'm the person who's taking these calls. It's really hard to hear those to take those calls um, and not have really any anything to to give them to be like oh well hopefully you know good luck to you hope you find hopefully you find some help when they, they couldn't find help that's why they called <laughs> so i'm like well we find something to to just something that will help at least ease the the uh the sort of despair and like the stress of of what that is you're already going through something that's very difficult physically and then emotionally it's it's hard family members don't often understand what that's like because you know there's there's a lot of there's smell there's a lot of stuff that's going on with it so you have to isolate yourself there's all this other stuff that that if there's if that's one way to help a little bit around that, um, and if it's just that, just sometimes hearing your voice on, on on a phone on the other end of the phone that's actually willing to listen, like I, I can't tell you how many times I've I've, I've heard from from people who were just appreciative to have someone actually allowing space for them to to list to share what's what's happening with them, even if nothing ultimately could come out of that particular that call, um, it made it it made me feel like okay there was some other difference being made here in the states as well that. If someone can call and just hear someone, have someone hear them, and and provide something, even if the, that that resource, even if it, wherever it might could lead to another resource that could, that could actually lead them to help, and that's hopeful, and it gives them some 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 hope. And I, I, I and my hope is that that's that happened enough where you know people were able to at least get pointed in the right direction. I think that at the end of the day, I was my hope was just to do that because I knew there wasn't really a lot that we could do as an organization here in the States because we just weren't set up for that. But it was, um, um, it was, it was important enough for me to, to at least try to do something around that, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. That's clear, <laughs> but yeah. No, it completely does. And actually our protocol, the RIR protocol is, it's rooted in like compassion and compassionate dialogue. And um, for those who don't know, I've known you for 20 years, almost, we're about to celebrate our 20 year anniversary, and you have always been, I think, um, I, can, I can genuinely say you're one of the most compassionate human beings I've ever met in my entire life. So I'm not surprised that you went above and beyond. I can see you staying on the phone, you've done it with me multiple <laughs> times in my life, so I, I can't imagine you wouldn't do it for just anybody in the world. Um, and I love because you, even though you don't really know our protocol well, you emulate it beautifully. And it's going to like this recognized piece, like you recognize that there was an issue um, that was bigger than you. And you recognize mm -hmm. that something needed to be done and that people needed that compassion um, beyond just a phone call or beyond just an email. And you recognize that and you, you know, and most of the time when we look at what our next step of interrupt is, is we look at it in a sense of like um, interrupting because it's a negative, but in your case, you've interrupted in such a positive way, right? You've done so much other stuff to make it um, something else than what it is. So whether you've gone the extra mile on the phone, whether you've gone the extra mile um, with the people you've met in these countries, and even your book, like just doing that interruption piece to say, I have all of this information, I recognize the inequities, I recognize that this doesn't make me feel good when I can, when I have to be like, oh, I can email you a list and see ya, that I'm going to do something else. And then you interrupted by, you know, do, going above and beyond and by stepping in and saying, I will help as much as I possibly can, I will help which I mean, I know you, and so I know that I'm not surprised, but I can make him cry in a heartbeat, by the way, so, <laughs> yes. I was, I was trying to hold it, I wasn't trying I know, to... I, you, you tried really hard, you made it like, I, I don't know, almost like 20 minutes, so you did great. <laughs> but, so tell us a little bit more about how, so you interrupted in, in ways of, you know, doing more on the phone and doing all of these other different things. What are other things that you've done? Well, I think one of the other, um, things that I thought was that I thought was important too was just just checking in. Sometimes, you know, oftentimes you have a it's a one-time interaction, 
And well, the expectation is that there's a one-time interaction and then that's it. Maybe they won't call back. Um, but sometimes people call back and they would call and ask for me, like inside, like just coming and take the call and just like, or just sending a checkup email. Hey, how, how are you doing? Like there were a couple people who were my age who were also suffering from fistula. I talked to some moms who were, who had daughters my age who were, who needed some help. And I would just send emails every now and again, how's, how's, how's she doing? And did you guys manage to find such and such help? Or did you guys, or I would, or I would take another, some more time, like days later and maybe find some more resources and go, hey, but maybe this might help. I don't know. I don't know if this works, let me know. Hey, I haven't heard from you in about a couple of weeks. You know, I just want to just check in, hope everything's okay. Just, you know, let me know if these these new things work or whatever. This is so things like that. I think were again, some of those things were not at all, part, you know. And then no one knew I was doing those things. I tried to just like, well, it wasn't like, okay, you just and no. it, those aren't those aren't things you report in meetings, team meetings, or anything like that. It's just more like, okay, well, you know. And it's not necessarily for like, you know, for to be recognized myself. It's not. It was yeah. just. It was, and I, you know, I would reach out to other doctors, people who I knew, who I knew, or connections who were surgeons and who had other, who also had their own connections that, hey, there's a person I know who's living in your area, you know, is there someone you can connect her to, to possibly get someone to at least talk to her about what's going on, or is there, what's the, what's, what's the best way to do this? And also try to, try to, you know, trying to do it in a way that's, that's um, the best way, or, you know, whatever that, whatever that means, the way that actually get, could get them closer to getting some support. Or getting someone to be in the office, be into the space of like you can talk about what's what's going on, and so I think those are some ways to um, that I think I've tried to interrupt uh, sort of what the the regular you know scheduled program of how how those things usually go. Yeah, just the the, the checking in. It's a it's a small thing outside of the the, uh, the normal sort of day to day, but it was something that you know you because it was it. You know, I'd go to bed thinking about it. I would go into work. I would leave the office still thinking about, dang it, what's, what, can, what, can, what can be done? <laughs> there weren't a lot of people I could really could talk to about that that would be um, supportive of what I was, what I was actually doing, <laughs> like trying to be like, fully supportive of, of that. Yeah. You know, they understood the feelings, of course, but we were all like, it's a, it's a very much, it was a heart piece. It felt like it was a, like a heart move, like just to yeah. be like, you know, that, that's beyond the, the day-to-day -day of phone calls, emails, whatever your sort of office tasks are, organizing files or whatever, it was something that was that was more important than the 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 office files or the yeah. you know just fixing up the, photocopying this other thing or whatever that was. It's like the, if because I feel like that's why we were really there. We're not there to photocopying stuff is just it's fine. We need to do that, but it's yeah here to help help these people who need help people people like who need help. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, I just want to also touch on one thing to actually move us forward into the next. You mentioned the inequities of um, the women that were that were suffering from this, from fistula, right? Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. What what did you notice trend-wise that was maybe well, surprising well, to you? Well, yeah, well, well, well trend-wise was more, so, the, so, the, so the, the initial thing was like, first, we're, okay, we're an organization in, based in the U.S. who are serving a group of, um, a, a population of women who are mostly black, African women, um, uh, and, and women of color, women in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, like, of, of color, who, uh, who are one women, they're of color, they don't have um, access to care, money, they don't have all the resources that were usually, um, the, the men has, have access to, to that. Um, and so uh, those are some of the major things that played into what we saw about the condition and how about fistula is not, it's, a, it's not, so it's childbirth injury, but also it's, a, it's an issue that's, that has to do with um, lack of access. Like uh, you, could, you could, if you had access, you, you could prevent a fistula, it's completely preventable. Yeah. You know, you'd have, you had just, I mean, access to care, but, but funds, travel, travel expenses, just getting, getting to, for, on a bus or, having shoes to walk if you needed to walk. Some women are, are walking for, for days, months, just to get to, to you know, they're walking from their, their village to another hospital, you know, a country away, the next, the next country, whatever it is to get somewhere, like just having some shoes or having just basic stuff. So I think um, um, those were, that was some of the, the, like poverty was the main challenge, yeah. like not having the access to like living, you know, Clean living conditions and yeah. and um, nutrition too, like lack of uh, nutritional. Uh, so like yeah. We're eating enough to stay nutritious, especially if you're pregnant, and you know you're about to have a baby. Some of the women were most of them were young moms, so their bodies were still sort of developing and still needing nutrients and things for the baby. It was still, those a lot of that stuff was not 
there. That yeah. was the major trend that I saw among, um, you know, among uh, the, the women there. Yeah. You're making cry. <laughs> Visit www.epoceducation.com for resources that will help you to understand and navigate the ever-changing world of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We are a company that trains and transforms with innovative in-person and online equity workshops that support school districts and leaders to build capacity to carry on this work internally. Now go out and have an epic day.